How was that called? It was, I don't know what it was called. Um, I have to look up what the name of the software was, but it was pretty, uh, pretty close to the real thing, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see you. Now, if I put no, this in into... screen, yes, we can also see that now. AI force for good. So if I put it into a slideshow, you can still see it now in a full screen or kind of expanded? It's yeah. better expanded, yeah. but we can also see ourselves as well at this time. Okay, so um, I'm just at a little disadvantage when I bring it into a slideshow, then I can't see yourself or myself. Um, but I'll try to toggle through a little bit. Uh, so for the first few minutes, I'll be driving blind. Um, <laughs> Well, we can't see you as, as yeah. you in the beginning. So everybody can see you. Yeah, so you can see me and you all can see the slides. So that's uh, that's important and everyone can see you. Uh, let me just get the combinations correct over here. So uh, just one second, at least let me expand this into as big as possible in that mode. And... Uh, uh, do you want to get a sneak preview or should I just surprise you? <laughs> surprise us. <laughs> to your okay. I, I, I like that. I like that spirit. <laughs> I like that spirit. So I'll just surprise you. I'll just set the stage. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, there's that little framework we've been toying around here, you know, AI at the intersection of you know, healthcare, medical science, at the intersection of law and ethics, and um, at the intersection of kind of, you know, capital markets and labor and some of those kind of things. Um, So we'll use those as kind of the primary themes. Uh, But then we can, you know, go into some tangents and that's okay, but at least that way the audience feel like, okay, yeah, there's a theme, these guys look like they're organized. Um, So, um, and then uh, in the closing part, if you all can, you know, kind of just hit home, hit home one of two things, either something that you are in pursuit, which is, you know, in the spirit of the Horasis community, um, you, you want to invite collaboration. It's totally fine. I mean, you know, not a sales pitch, but basically whatever your pursuits are, and there might be a good, uh, uh, a good uh, kind of a connection. The other one is, um, and you can pick and choose whichever one. The other one is a call for action, right? So think about some call for action to the larger audience, to kind of the community, to the industry, something like that. Mm-hmm. That that's sort of where we will kind of conclude after we've you know uh, made our way through this. Any any questions? Any other comments? Uh, we got about five minutes more. Okay, and then, uh, so I'll do some uh, stage setting slides, just some provocation. Um, And then I'll, you know, somewhere either on the cover or right here, um, uh, or maybe somewhere in between, I'll say a one line introduction for each of you. And then when when I point a question towards you for the first time, um, do the rest of your introduction yourself, and then uh, you know uh, get on to the question after that. So what I'm trying to avoid is a linear introduction, you know, <clears throat> right up front uh, from everybody. So I, I'm just trying to introduce that variation in between. Um, have you all, did you all attend any of the other sessions? How are they going? Not yet. <laughs> no, not had a chance yet. Okay. So how do we enter this thing now? Did that pause the screen? Uh, there's no 
presentation now. We are all seeing each other. We can't see the slides. Okay, so you know when the slide was on, then my start stream button was not there. Um, so let me just try this. So this is this is the screen I want to share and share video can you make it uh, full screen um, uh, you know uh, yeah I'll, I, I'll, uh, I'm not in full screen right now I'm just looking for how to start the start the stream how to enter the stream yeah this is strange uh, the enter stream button goes away mm -hmm. when I'm in slideshow mode. So let me stop the screen and I'm going to go into the stream. All of us are going to go into, into the stream now. All right. So confirm we are starting the stream. Go live. All right. So we're going live now. All right. I think we are live. And there are six people, and there are six of us. And there are five comments, and somebody just joined. Okay, good. Anna Paycheck joined. Welcome, Anna. We'll get started in a few minutes. And I'm going to see. Uh, now tell me what happened. I'm going to try sharing the screen. Anna, can you hear us okay? Since you joined early, we'll use you as a test. Anna, if you can hear us okay, just type a yes into the chat. Yeah, I think she responded yes on the chat. She did? Okay. Yeah. All right, now tell me, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, making, making, uh, making progress here. All right, <clears throat> looks like we are situated right in time. <clears throat> mm. Let's give it another 30 seconds for people to transition. We have about two people joining us. Uh, Gui, uh, um, I can only see myself on the screen, actually. You can you can see only yourself? Yeah. I don't know what happened. Sure. Okay. Um, I can see everybody. But your audio is clear, and I can see you. Oh, okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. You got it. No, what happened? Okay. okay. So is, let's... Is, is just one question: Are we recording the session? Um, it's not in my control. If they're recording in the back, they are doing it on their own. I don't think I control that. Okay. All right. So uh, I think we are situated, and it's uh, it's time now. Let me move this into kind of the slideshow mode, we have about uh, four attendees, and I'm sure a few others will sort of just trickle in over here. Yeah, they're coming in. All right. All right, let's go. Hi, everybody. My name is Gurvinder Aluwalia, and uh, you've joined the panel on AI as a force for the good, just to make sure you got a full screen in front of you. And uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have on this panel five distinguished experts uh, from a very uh, vibrant uh, cross-section of disciplines, all of whom are going to weigh into uh, AI 
uh, as a force for force for good, which uh, perhaps is the hypothesis, and we'll find out at the end of the session whether we accept it or not, or at least the pros and cons of it. Um, let me just uh, introduce briefly uh, some of the panelists, and then they'll provide their own indi individual introductions as we as we point uh, the microphone towards them. Um, just so uh, the audience knows that uh, while I, as the moderator, am in the slide uh, slideshow kind of full screen mode, I cannot see the chat window. I have only a few states that in kind of slides. I'll go through them quickly, and then I'll exit out of this mode, and then I'll be able to see the chat session. All right, so if you're chatting, just bear with me for a few minutes. I won't have visibility into it. So um, the first person um, uh, on the panel is Rana Gujral. Rana is based out of uh, San Francisco. And uh, he's an expert, um, uh, not just in AI. He's, he's an investor. He's an entrepreneur. He's a turnaround artist of uh, multiple companies previously. And he's been working on some breakthrough technologies that he'll elaborate himself about. Which is um, which is emotion and, and intelligence, I believe, using verbal uh, using verbal uh, uh, voice senses in order to in order to uh, profile behavior for uh, benevolent uh, purposes. I might add. So I leave the rest of the elaboration to Rana. He can describe it much better. Then we have Ayla. Ayla is the expert on our panel from the medical sciences. Healthcare, I would say, and I can't, I, you know, I can't even do any justice to this deep, deep specialty that she is in, and she's working in some specialized medical care uh, treatment for cardiac. I, I don't even know the terminology to, uh, to, to, to describe it in plain English. So, Ella, I will defer to you in a, in a few moments to give an introduction of yourself. Um, then we have. Uh, uh, Jean Lehman is uh, um, has an extensive background in financial modeling, and it's no surprise that he has evolved himself in, into a um, into a preeminent expert in cybersecurity. So he'll be weighing in on the AI aspects related to um, privacy, related to cybersecurity, uh, and so on. Julian Weisenberg is based, and John is based out of uh, uh, John is based out of. Uh, uh, Jean, you're out of Fra uh, London, London, yes, not France, but London. Thank you. Um, Julian is, and Ayla is based in the U.S. in Wisconsin. Julian uh, Weisenberg is based out of Zurich. He's a computer science. He's an expert in computer vision. Um, uh, he's a Ph.D. and he's been doing some very, very deep research in um, in the use of uh, uh, computer vision, and uh, there's, there's a very interesting discussion that I want to invoke and also invite questions from the audience. Marta is our resident attorney. She's the one who keeps us out of trouble. Um, and if you've ever heard of the term crypto lawyer, she's probably the best thing over there. Uh, she's out of the Silicon Valley. Uh, Rana is also out of San Francisco, by the way. And Marta is um, uh, also an expert on the... Uh, bias aspects that we all so much hear uh, related to AI, and uh, we'll touch upon uh, some of those aspects of AI and criminal uh, justice, and she's got a lot to contribute to the panel. So you'll hear a little bit more introduction. I just wanted to give you kind of a top-level view. Uh, I'll do my introduction if there's time later on, okay? Uh, so if we look at, uh, you know, some of the some of the um, frontier technologies, um, AI, blockchain, Internet of Things, I picked these as these also happen to be my areas of expertise, particularly blockchain and Internet of Things. So I've got a pop quiz here for the audience, right? So I'm kind of going to come out of slideshow because I want to see some of the answers as well. So if, if blockchain were to be a, a trust technology and IoT were to be kind of, you know, reaching out into the physical, what would you characterize AI to be? What is AI about? So this is a question for the audience, and later the panel can tell you the right answer from their perspective. Is AI about automation? Is it about prediction? Or is it about autonomous? Right. So hold that question in your mind and chat the answers into, into, the, into, the, into the chat screen um, uh, over there. Right. We'll, we'll come to it in just a moment. Um, I want to provide three provocations real quickly. 
One is this very interesting chart, which I think the panelists, most of you have seen this uh, during our preparations earlier. This is from some study that McKinsey has done uh, in light of COVID, where they are pointing out that there is a large overlap on the jobs that have been uh, lost or, at, or are at risk uh, because of COVID in the immediate, in the short term, which would have also be at which would have also been at risk uh, anyway because of automation in the long in the long term. That overlap number is ten percent. This is a Europe study, and in Europe, this um, this calculates to an impact to twenty four million jobs. So the impact areas are arising because of healthcare, because of medical sciences, because of jobs, and because of automation. This is a very interesting quantification that I found kind of provocative for this discussion. The second provocation I want to raise is related to tax. So um, they call this robot subsidy. And the main point of this slide is that if you look at the yellow line, that's the basically the tax burden for labor. And the tax burden for labor has, has been pretty much a straight line for since 1982. And if you look at the red lines, that's the tax burden applying to software and to equipment. And you can see that's been on a decline. In other words, the tax structure, uh, I can't tell easily until I go deeper into this. My screen is partly hidden, uh, whether this is a worldwide study or US or Europe. Uh, but regardless, the tax structure over here is favoring the use of capital expense as opposed to labor kind of expenses, right? So keep that in mind. Um, thank you, Marta, for uh, pointing me to this article, and I'll let you speak to it, but I wanted to open it from a provocation standpoint on the bias aspects. Um, this is where, a for a petty crime, a black person was predicted to be at a much higher risk than a, pers than a, white, than a white person, because that's how the criminal justice uh, prediction algorithms were have been coded, right? So Marta will elaborate a little bit more uh, on this article that she pointed me, which comes from uh, ProPublica. So those are the provocations that I wanted to raise. And when we put those data points together, the themes that uh, that we'd like to look at in this panel basically circle around AI on three pillars. One is its interface with healthcare and medical sciences. The other is with law and ethics. And the third is with capital markets, economics, and that's where job displacements, automation, and those kind of things fall in. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'm going to close the screen over here and uh, bring back everybody's wonderful faces into my view. Um, and I see we have 18 total. Uh, so that's about 12 people in the audience. So thank you, everybody, for... Um, uh, for joining, and I'll take a peek at the um, at the at the chat in just a moment. So let me let me go with uh, perhaps with Ayla in the way the agenda has been listed. There's no particular order. I'm sorry. Perhaps with uh, Rana, uh, just the way the the agenda has been listed is how I also kind of ordered this. Rana, can you um, take a take a minute or so to give a little bit more elaboration on your background and expertise? And then the question I have for you is uh, maybe that, that'll be a natural segue into, into describing how sensory information, verbal information um, is being used with the right levels of privacy, if it is, uh, for um, profiling and for matchmaking with AI algorithms. Uh, Rana, over to you. Thank you, Guri. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be at this wonderful panel among really smart people. What we do is uh, focus on unraveling insights from the tone of voice. And when I say tone of voice, I really mean prosody, uh, tonality, the pitch and tonal variance. And in simple terms, uh, when, you're, when you're having a conversation, there are two really big elements of that, uh, of that dialogue. One is understanding what the person's saying, and then also understanding how the person's saying whatever they're saying. So outside of the language, outside of the content, it's really focusing on the actual delivery of the content. 
And so for, for the most part, we focus on the how part um, and unravel from that how part, from the tonality, a variety of insights, emotion insights, like anger, happiness, sadness, behavioral insights, such as engagement, empathy, politeness, and, and go as far as predict uh, and unravel uh, intent insights in, in the sense of predicting uh, action uh, the person will take in the near future in terms of whether the person will buy or not buy or pay or not pay or will they do the discussion, uh, you know, do an action that's in the context of the discussion at hand. And so that's really the core of our science. We've spent uh, over two decades uh, focusing on that area of research. Uh, we've had many multiple breakthroughs. What we've done with that core technology is we've built some compelling products um, that uh, that really help maximize business conversations. Um, we've built some specialized products for the FSIs, for the banks specifically, um, to help with the help with the very complex conversations around collections, which is uh, certainly a big major issue right now in the post-COVID era, um, and a variety of other applications, uh, you know, in human to machine context as well, where you start talking to a robot or an inanimate system, and you're really expecting that machine to have capabilities similar to a human. So that's really what we do. I mean, in terms of the, the last quick thing, in terms to the question that you had, Guri, was uh, the tone of voice is very, very powerful. When you're looking at understanding the state of mind, um, you know, ha having the cognitive connection with the, the participant uh, in, in a conversation with you. Of course, um, you know, when you talk about emotions and behavior, they're multimodal and we express that in many different ways. We do that through facial expressions. We do that through uh, what we say, how we say, also our body language. Um, but, uh, for the most part, the tone of voice is very primal and probably the most powerful and it's, it's possible. And it's also very common for us to mask how we feel through our facial expressions. It's something that we've gotten pretty good at, uh, but it's almost impossible to mask how you actually feel, uh, through your tone of voice. So if you focus on that part, um, you can really cue in into some, some really accurate assessments of how the person's feeling. And uh, then, of course, the applications are boundless and endless and, you know, uh, happy to deep dive and get into any of those discussion points today. I'll pause there for a bit. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and by the way, could you all just mute for when you're not speaking? Um, uh, that'll give you a little, little bit uh, uh, less static. So uh, thanks so much, uh, Rana, for the introduction and for addressing the question. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to do it now, but I'll give a cue to Marta that I'm going to ask Marta on the legal implications uh, in a few minutes on, on, on this, on the, on, on, on this uh, stuff that Ron is developing, right, on uh, tonal recognition. And uh, I, w I want to get your insight in just a moment, so I'll just park that question ahead of time. But I want to go to Ayla uh, in the order that we have over here. Ayla, can you... Um, can you give us a little introduction um, of yourself, um, some very, very deep work that you're doing? And I know you've told me you're not a vaccine expert, but I think you are the best expert that we have to tell us um, the, you know, the, the, the burning question of the, of the times. And that is, is AI helping in the development of the vaccine? And if it is, then, you know, all of AI's evils will be forgiven in, in rescuing humanity. So could you please introduce yourself, uh, Ayla, and then um, uh, then address the question how AI, how AI is, he is helping in the development of uh, vaccine for COVID-19. Thank you, Guri. Uh, first of all, I appreciate to be here and very exciting to be with each one of you and contribute. Uh, I am the uh, CEO of In Vivo Sciences, and we are developing novel treatments for genetically defined heart failure to cure heart disease one gene at a time. The way that AI play role in here, which is a strong role, is that we are able to take directly cells, uh, urine samples, or blood samples direct from patients and to create the microhuman heart tissues to test the efficacy and safety of the drugs. And this platform we call New Heart is integrated with artificial intelligence. And uh, this number one, uh, helps the decrease the cost of the drug development and increase the predictive power of the technology, the drug 
and the matching to the population, such as that you can stratify the patient populations based on the genetic inherited diseases. And this is important in the heart failure because one drug is not only one that solve everybody's problem of heart failure. And it's number one killer around the world, especially in the United States, and including children and uh, all and older populations and women are most vulnerable. In the vaccine development, uh, uh, I am not expert of developing vaccines, but I do know that AI comes into critical role of safety and efficacy and repositioning of drugs much quicker, much effectively, and also in the testing at the back in a preclinical stage, because right now they have to really do this in the manner to, to make the timelines to match and, and also bring something safe out to the humans. And uh, in the clinical trials, they are doing it with a limited number of patients and the testing that, and then there will be an effect in the long term. AI's best help here to predict the safety and also predict the effective matching to the populations they are going after with the limited clinical trials that they have. So I think uh, it is important. And in the repositioning, uh, I will be uh, uh, seeing the AI will be very useful for the current drug levers. If they come up with a totally new, novel compound that takes very timely and it is very expensive, but there is a potential of repositioning in the process, which is already tested and safety of the compound is known on the human populations. And those are uh, some helpful side of AI as we use to create human heart and integrate with AI to make the human heart that we create is much more exactly like human heart. You have to train the human heart with the AI information coming from the donor, which is the gold standard of the human heart. And that is a very rigorous process. And that helps actually the predictive power of the the artificial intelligence and also the human heart tissues that is created from direct the patients. So patients are now at preclinical. Uh, they are not just at the end of the, the process. And that's exciting for the new future generation drugs, both novel and repositioning. Thank you, Ella, uh, for the introduction and for addressing the question. We'll come back to you, uh, I'm sure. And and by the way, in the audience, uh, please, uh, you know, just line up your questions into the chat. I can now see the chat, so I'll start processing. Uh, you know, whenever we we take a pause from the floor over here, I'll I'll turn to your questions. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, turn to uh, uh, Jean. Uh, the you know, I, I, can you, of course, first please introduce yourself uh, with far more elaboration and, uh, you know, justice than I did. Um, and then um, uh, can you address the question on AI's use in um, cybersecurity? And if you want to put a slant on financial services, given that's a lot of your background, that's fine. Uh, but maybe in terms of cybersecurity, we still see breaches. We still see ransomware, um, you know, depending on how you look at the glass, you know, there's still quite a bit of mess in terms of cybersecurity. So I uh, would uh, invite you to please tell us about your great work and background and then uh, take that question. All right. Thank you, Guri. It's great to be here with all of you uh, on this panel. I much appreciate the, the opportunity <clears throat> today. So my company, Cyber Capital HQ, uh, based in London, is a consulting advisory company in cybersecurity technology and digital transformation. So we very much look at the um, cybersecurity in the context of digital transformation. <clears throat> and we work with the leading companies, the tech companies, that actually apply artificial intelligence to solve some of the most complex um, problems and challenges uh, in the cybersecurity um, um, today. I'm also an advisor to venture capital funds on artificial intelligence investments and generally interested in the intersection of, and the convergence of technologies and trends and understanding the intersection of policy, regulation and, and technology. So going back to your question uh, around how artificial intelligence can be applied to, to cybersecurity. So um, I think that there's, there's another considerations. And one of the first questions is to understand what, what are we trying to achieve in cybersecurity? 
And the, the key uh, question that comes um, uh, to, 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 to light is really much around the notion of cyber resilience, meaning that connected systems are by nature vulnerable. From the moment, from the moment uh, a system is connected, it's by definition prone to be hacked. So we can't, uh, unless we, we actually disconnect totally a system from the, from the internet, it's, uh, it's a, there will always be a, a likelihood of, of being hacked. So the question is, what is the likelihood of being hacked and what is the impact uh, of being hacked? So that is the whole question of the resiliency. So essentially in cybersecurity, we, we're looking to implement security controls, controls across the people, process and technology framework to, to minimize to increase the resiliency, meaning minimizing the likelihood of being breached and minimizing the impact in case of, of a breach. So, um, so very much the, the question of, uh, of resiliency. And we're looking to, to implement controls and technology in such a way that we can actually uh, maximize return investments on this technology, decrease risk, mitigate risks, um, increase productivity, and, 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 um, um, uh, efficiency and, 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 and save costs. So very much we're looking at the, at the convergence the synergies between usability, security, and also privacy, because some of the uh, questions may be conflicting sometimes. Security might, might come at the expense of usability or privacy. So how we do we actually reconcile the notion of security, privacy, and usability? And, and today, we're working to, towards that, that direction. And more specifically around uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, this is very vast uh, in cybersecurity. Um, so, so, so for, for example, uh, one of the questions uh, in the application of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity is the notion of the prevention, the prediction and prevention against zero-day threats, zero-day malware. What is a zero-day threat? What is a zero-day malware? It's a known known threat. It, it is... A, a new threat uh, about which we have no knowledge. So um, traditional antivirus are based on signatures. So essentially, you scan files against a hash of of a data of a database of signatures, and if there's a match, then the file, the, the malicious file, is flagged as well. The file is flagged as malicious. But the problem is, what if there is no known signature in the database? Then the file. If you use uh, traditional uh, or legacy solutions um, for this problem, is not going to be uh, flagged uh, as, um, as 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 malicious one. So it's going to be a false negative. Um, so so so, for example, uh, applying artificial intelligence um, to cybersecurity allows us to predict and prevent uh, those zero day threats with a very high level of accuracy. And there are several companies in this field. I mean, I could cite companies like Silence, uh, like Deep, Deep Instinct, which is applying deep learning uh, to, to this field. And so es essentially, um, those companies are working at the inter intersection of data science and cybersecurity, looking to develop the most advanced models to, to tackle those, those problems. And what is interesting, when we look at the evolution of those models, we, we kind of notice that those mo models, or in general, generally speaking, AI models have evolved from um, uh, descriptive models to predictive models to prescriptive models. So um, AI has evolved from a passive tool to a more contextual, more generative, more intuitive tool. So it's essentially, it's interesting to notice that artificial intelligence is in a way moving up the, the, the ladder, the ladder of cognitive functions. So it is becoming more contextual, more human-like. And when you look at the convergence of big data, analytics, cloud and AI, and the capabilities and the, the sheer amount of volume of information that, that we can actually, that AI and, and analytics can actually, um, cloud is, is a big um, disruptor around the technology that we can develop. So, so around the question, and some of the, the challenges uh, more technically would be around developing the next generations of models around the runtime, the features, data sets, the inter human interaction. And one of the challenges is, is in terms of the finding the right fit for the models making sure that those models are either not overfitted or underfitted. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to hear more on that thinking, uh, Jean. I, 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 you know, the situation of not having a signature uh, in a breach situation is almost like a COVID-19 situation where the signature of this real virus is, uh, you know, uh, not known sufficiently. Uh, so it's interesting how... Uh, 
um, how how computer science and technology is finding increasingly more inspiration from uh, from biology, and as Ella was explaining, the use of digital into into the medical science sciences. So there's a very very interesting synergy and cross pollination over here. Um, uh, thank you so much, and and uh, welcome welcome to to all of you. Let me let me move to the last two over here. Uh, Julian um, is, uh, as I said, uh, he's a, he's an expert in the computer vision. Uh, Julian, could you um, explain um, your background? You know, what is it that you're advancing in the industry? And the question that I have for you is: Is it true that on a camera and a session like this? AI can read my eye expressions or my cheek expressions or my complexion, you know, whether I'm blushing or not, and 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 detect my sentiments. Is is this technology close to reaching that stage? Right, we'll go to this. Uh, thank you, Guri. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julian, and I'm an AI expert with a focus in computer vision. I worked on many different applications like uh, 3D reconstructions, document analysis, infrastructure inspection, food inspection, warehouse optimization. Um, and I do an advisory. I help companies and organizations figure out their data strategy, what algorithm to use, uh, basically just uh, how to make things work. Um, and I also do a due diligence uh, on the tech aspect of things. Now to your question. Uh, yes, the, the tools that we have already for quite some time now are uh, very well able to uh, read people, um, not only your feelings or expressions, but uh, something that struck me was uh, a few years back, there was a research that was looking at micro movements and amplifying them. Um, and this can be used, for example, to check the pulse of someone just by looking at the picture. Your complexion varies a little bit as your heart beats. So we can see uh, the frequency of your heart beating and uh, breathing, which may be useful uh, for maybe good and bad, but at least it could be useful, for example, to monitor a, a baby uh, to see how they're doing. Yeah, very good. Uh, that's a very good point. So it's the same technology. This is like uh, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like uh, so many other things, that it's the same technology that can be useful for watching, monitoring a baby, um, but then it could be used in in uh, in more um, dubious ways uh, um, to 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 detect, like you know, how my heartbeat is feeling like right now, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. it can also be used for. Um watching over by the window at a packet of crisp or a light bulb and try to reconstruct the sound that's in the room from the vibrations. Don't tell me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll come back to you. This is, this is very good. Thank you. So um, um, let's um, uh, thank you and welcome, uh, Julian. Uh, let's come to Marta. As I said, uh, uh, people in the audience, she's the resident uh, attorney on our panel. And Marta, it's uh, uh, of course, it's by coincidence that your name was just ordered in this list at the end. Uh, but I think it serves a very good purpose. I think you know you can. I want you to now take the legal knife and sear it through everybody uh, on what they said. So uh, could you please give us an introduction of yourself? And, uh, you know, pick any of those. I mean, you got like, you got a full buffet over here. You can pick on the private, on privacy aspects, on tonal recognition that, uh, that, uh, uh Rana is messing around with, or you can, um, you know, look at what, uh, uh, Julian is messing around with. And, uh, you know, can you unpack the legal aspects, uh, after you give us, um, uh, an introduction of, uh, of your expertise and work, please? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Marta Belcher. I'm an attorney in the Silicon Valley uh, focusing on emerging technologies. Uh, and um, so, so much to say in this area. Um, I'll try not to pick on anyone um, in particular. Um, but I will say, I, I think one thing that's um, really interesting about this space is that um, algorithms already make 
so many decisions uh, that that affect human lives, um, whether it's, you know, price discrimination uh, when you're shopping for an airline tickets back when people used to shop for airline tickets um, or or or, you know, whether it's as as Gurry previewed things like uh, sentencing recommendations. Um, and um, I think um, I think that the the potential implications of not just having an algorithm where you can actually see, you know, if X, then Y, but, but rather something where you're, you're going into the world of AI and you can't just go look at the code and see how it's making decisions. Um, you suddenly have uh, a, a real problem potentially with transparency and in, in how those decisions are being made. Um, so I won't jump the gun and start talking about the bias. I know you wanted to save that for a little later, um, but but I will I will uh, I think mark that as a a theme across all of the things we've talked about so far. Excellent, Mora. Since uh, you you were last in the introduction, for so welcome everybody and thanks uh, kind of for the, you know those opening kind of questions. So we we got much more uh, to to dive through over here. Mora, let me just uh, flip the order around a little bit and then we'll go to and fro over here. Um, uh, since uh, thank you for sending me that article. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit more around the challenges of bias of algorithms in the criminal justice system? I think that article. Uh, and that provocation that slide I put together is probably U.S. specific, but I, I'm guessing, or you can tell us if it applies, if it's happening in other countries. Yeah, you know, my understanding is this is actually a pretty common practice. Um, so at, at least in the United States, um, a variety of states, when they're doing criminal sentencing, um, will will actually have a uh, what's called a risk assessment uh, that's given to the judges to help assist them in understanding how likely uh, this particular uh, person is to offend again. Um, and, and that is put together um, based on um, an algorithm created by a private company. And it's based on 183 um, questions and that, that are either pulled from these people's history or that um, are, are actually answered by, by these people. So questions like, did you have a uh, relative who, who went to prison? Those types of questions. One of the questions, by the way, is not race. They do not put race in as a factor. Um, but nonetheless, um, per perhaps unsurprisingly, what you find um, when you actually look at what types of numbers come out in terms of you know, how risky someone is, is when, when the algorithm errs, um, it tends to err in favor of non uh, non black offenders, um, and so you know how does that end up happening? Yeah, this is the this is a slide that shows you um, the 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 risk assessment there, um, and and so how how does that happen? Well, I, a, a quick story that I think is really illustrative is um, Amazon tried to create an uh, an algorithm that you could feed it resumes. And it would it would look at you know it had a training set of all of the resumes of the people who had you know done really well at Amazon or not done well at Amazon um, and and the idea would be you'd put in resumes and then out the other side um, would come uh, you know the five people that you should you should interview um, based just on what's on their resume and what happened is the algorithm actually uh, was extremely biased against women and so. When you when you fed it a training uh, data set, what it learned was um, the people who were successful were men, and so it actually started discounting resumes that had the word women in the resume, such as um, the women's you know I'm on the women's uh, women in tech uh, advisory board, right? Um, and it also started discounting um, women's colleges. Um, so so another sort of I think uh, example of how you can see biases. Um, Really amplified by by these types of algorithms and and by AI itself. Very very. Um, I, I'd like to say it's interesting, but it's uh, it's it's quite it's quite uh, uh, it's quite scary. I, I, I I'm going to turn to um, to Rana in, in just a moment, uh, and I, I remember. Uh, uh, Marta, when you and I were talking, and I'm from a computer science background, um, just by way of snippets of introduction, um, uh, I'm the CEO of Digital Twin Labs, 
And uh, we put uh, digital platforms together based on frontier technologies, particularly blockchain, um, but also at the intersection of IoT and uh, cloud and increasingly machine learning. Um, so when when we were doing a little bit of preparation, I think one of the things you you pointed out, uh, and and I'm I'm going to actually point this question, uh, Rana, to you, is is you know when we study computer science, we 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 study you know it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So in the from from your expertise, Rana, in kind of the the new renaissance of AI, AI has been around since 1940s or so, something like that. In this renaissance of AI, is it indeed still garbage in, garbage out? Is it indeed still, uh, is it indeed um, um, uh, human bias uh, getting reflected into algorithmic bias? Or is it just inaccuracies of the, of the algorithm? Yeah, you know, this is a this is a very uh, interesting and also very complicated discussion. I I I I have I have to say, you know, there's many multiple facets uh, when you're looking at biases. First off, a few few facts, right? So, um, Marta already talked about it, but specifically in terms of how some of these algorithms uh, affect our lives on a day to day basis. Uh, whether it's algorithms in general, computers or software systems or AI and AI making certain decisions in terms of how things impact us on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's far more prevalent than people understand or realize. Uh, it's very widespread uh, in all aspects. I mean, it could be in a simple aspect of, you know, applying for uh, an insurance coverage, um, you know, and in terms of or, or a loan application from a bank. Uh, or, you know, just simply like life insurance, essentially, you know, you guys have all gone through that process uh, where they determine your risk profile and and race and gender is part of that. Um, you know, absolutely, they will profile you in terms of what your longevity looks like based on where you were born and, uh, you know, what, what sex uh, you are and, you know, your, your, of course, age and other things and, you know, health profiles. So the, it's all there, right? Now, uh, when you're talking about, uh, so we can discuss morality, uh, but you know, for in, a, in a capitalist setup, um, businesses are allowed to make determinations in terms of what's profitable to them versus uh, what, what they would service or not service. And I think there's a lot of uh, checks and balances needed there, but for the most part that exists. Bias is an interesting question, right? So uh, when you're building an AI solution, you have an incredible amount of responsibility to ensure um, you're, you're building it the right way. Uh, when you're building models you, and, you know, you're building models based on certain data sets, uh, you obviously have to require a tremendous amounts of data. But outside of data, you also need some specific subject matter expertise that is needed to fine tune that data in order to build those models. And that's where the bias creeps in, right? So it's like, take a simple example, like annotation. And if you're gonna take audio files or even take video files and you're going to now market based on certain markers, uh, a human expert will have to do that. Therein brings in the aspect of bias. And if you're annotating an audio file and you're, you don't have a very stringent mechanism to ensure that it's not done by a certain pool or certain, certain type of annotators who all belong to a certain group. They could all be, you know, young people or they could all be male or you hired a group of annotators who all happen to be in say Brazil and those cultural aspects uh, of uh, those individuals are going to creep in into how they see those data points. And uh, as a result, in order to really do that simple aspect of annotating an audio file, and that's one of the most simpler things that we could talk about here, there's vastly more complex aspects that we can get into. You are now, in order to do it right, you need to now select a, a group of individuals who are cross-cultural, different uh, distribution of ages and gender and sex and, you know, even geographical, uh, you know, locations and aspects. It's very hard. How many of us doing it the right way? So it's needless to say, a lot of the AI systems that we see out there, 
a lot of biases creeping in. And in fact, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, ineffective systems at the end of the day. Although, I mean, the, the big incentive to an AI developer, uh, especially a company, is to make sure that whatever they're building in terms of a knowledge base of an AI model, eventually, in order for it to be effective, it has to be without bias. Um, or else it won't necessarily work. It'd be less accurate. So that's the capitalist outside of rules and regulations yep. and compliance. That's the incentive for them to do it the right way. Otherwise, it just simply won't work. Yeah. And it would be ineffective in terms of problems it's looking to solve. Um, but recently, so that's that, right? Uh, we dealt with an inter- interesting dilemma. So now if you're talking about, say, singularity, right, or you're building uh, a self-learning intelligence system, um, the goal therein is obviously to bring into that inanimate system capabilities that are as close to a human as possible. And that is really the goal is to, you know, to allow it to uh, the power of independent thinking. Now, we as humans, we learn bias, right? So we learn bias from an environment where none of us are born biased, uh, but then we get biased really quickly based on what we're hearing from our parents, uh, our friends, our, you know, in terms of whether the Democrats or Republicans and how they see or react to certain situations. And that affects our thinking. And then, you know, we're creeping in and we're taking it into the, from, from that environment and becoming biased. So you can take an unbiased system and if it's truly self-learning, it'll quickly become biased based on the environment. So now yeah. the dilemma for AI developers is, are you going to allow that engine or that entity to self-learn and think and be biased as a natural human would be? Or would you influence it with your own thinking and try to inject capabilities to make sure it doesn't get biased? What do you do? Which one's moral? Which one's the right way to do? Yeah. I mean, um, if you really truly want to not interfere, then you are going to build bias systems and you have an AI algorithm that is built in a specific country. It will think that engine, that software and that robot will think like the rest of the countrymen. Yeah. Same way, similarly biased. So, yeah. and, and who's, and then whose morality and whose ethics, right? So, and I um, think there's, me, there's some really unanswered questions that we're still right. grass, uh, grappling with. Totally. Let me switch gears and uh, um, uh, Jean. I want to point a question from the from the chat gallery here. Uh, Tim Nickel is asking: um, uh, the opportunities are significant, but governance is, is is important. Who should be the gatekeepers, and are national responses sufficient given the issues raised? And since you're based in UK. I think it's okay for you to speak from the UK perspective or otherwise broader Europe perspective. Sure. Uh, and thank you, Tim, for, for the question. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, believe it or not, 45 minutes are over. We've got 15 minutes left, so we'll have to just cycle through real quickly. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, AI is just not just a technology issue. It encompasses policy, regulation, social, ethical, philosophical questions. It's, it's a quite broad issue. And the limitation actually might not be in the technology but actually in the policy response. So, for example, in COVID, there's certainly a limitation around technology. But at the same time, there's also a, a lack of coordination in policy responses. So that's also an effort where the private sector and the, and, and the public sector, sector and governments need to come together to implement effective policy responses. And, and that's, th- that is something which is very much on the agenda. And we see, like, in, in the UK, how do we actually develop the right narrative so we can educate people, so we can... Uh, so that AI is not just perceived as a black box that only the, the very uh, the experts uh, understand, but but actually we, the general public, understand the benefits uh, for society as a whole. And the question is, how can we actually implement policies in, in such a way that, one, we, we precisely increase this level of awareness, and second, at the same time, we kind of unlock um, the, 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 the potential, you know, uh, around technology so that there is no limitation uh, you know around the policy response so i mean i think these are some of the questions that are um, um worth um question right? and and also i think there's a there's a great opportunity for private sector and policy makers to come together and implement effective policy and technology thank you thank you let me turn to um i'm keeping an eye on the chat uh, so audience please uh 
uh, drop your questions in. You got about fifteen minutes still left, so we want to we want to capture a reasonable diversity in the remaining time. Uh, Ella, uh, let me come back to you. Uh, can you enlighten us a little bit more um, uh, on when you were going after the use of AI in vaccines? Um, is it reducing the uh, the you know the various or certain stages of the testing, or is it providing better prediction on on those testing stages? Uh, in terms of the how we use AI, and mm -hmm. I am just making a, a parallel to the vaccine because we are not in the development of vaccine, but sure. what AI does uh, mm -hmm. significantly in our technology base, I can create any one of your heart tissue, and that's a technology, and then from your blood or your urine sample, just that way in four weeks. Well, that heart tissue is just a tissue. It's not you yet, but it has your genomic information. It is your also your immune system information inside. And that is utilized as you at preclinical. But it is much important that it's still anything, the tissues or organs or chips, whatever the technologies are doing, they are not human yet. And they are predicting based on those technologies, human response before the clinical trials. And it's important because when they get to the clinical trials, they are failing, 40% of the drugs are failing at that later stage, which is a huge investment loss and success rates are pretty low. Uh, they are in the one digits and that is a really waste of immense amount of money. And in the heart failure, not many success is happening, and that's the number one killer. So what is AI is going to do or happen to do for our technologies is training based on the human donor heart and the created tissue heart from the patients. They are making that per imperfections perfect by data from the real human to the created tissue and prediction power is there getting higher. Well, a couple of things can be helpful here. Number one, genetic differences will come into much quicker into the response because we have access to the human data and that genetic information is important to focus and match the drug development and even your repositioning. And it is cost effective manner. AI is very important to decrease the cost of drug development, which is doing the second, it is matching and stratifying the patient populations, just like the, you are utilizing in the you know, criminal justice or face recognition or emotional part. The drugs needs to match to the human. I just want to give you a, a grave concern that I have, uh, and uh, that is where the importance of coming as a together uh, unity and work together is that cancer patients, uh, if they have inherited heart failure conditions and they are exposed to chemotherapy and if it is not known and if it is not looked at genetically, they have much higher risk of having a heart failure and drugs are not very really effective for heart failure. COVID-19, the number one reason to death, uh, people think that ventilator is not there, but when your heart failed and stopped, you don't have anything to offer to you for heart failure. And, and COVID-19, that reason number one is heart failure. So even you have a ventilator, if your heart failed because it is inflated and there is not much they can do there for drugs, it is, it is that, nothing there. For children, same problem, the clinical trials. So that AI for vaccines, I think I could say safety to the human and matching the timelines we have under the emergency condition, when everything is rushed, how to make sure that the vaccine will match to the human population with genetic differences. And with the number of people they are testing on, how they will assure that will work for a long term with no consequences. And there is where AI could help and to solve the problem. And AI has to be trained based on the human constantly. So it is going to evolve 
to match the human responses. And there is where the challenges that we all face and the technologies will come together. You know, as I was saying, I, as I was thinking, as I grow older, I want to get to know you better so you can uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can help my conditions. Uh, so I want to turn to Julian. Uh, by the way, just a logistical thing. Um, Rana and uh, Marta, can you, uh, is your audio good? Because I've lost video on you. I think I'm here. All right. Rana, are you there? Yeah, I'm here okay. as well, Good. and I'm not sure what the video is. No, that's was. fine. Sometimes it's just happening in my view over here. Uh, so, Julian, um, I've got two questions for you. One is uh, one is on this slide, right? I, I want you to answer whether AI is about automation, prediction, autonomous. That's but that's a kindergarten question for you. Uh, so I got to be I got to be fair, you know, to 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 to, to you. Uh, there are these terms of you know unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and then something called self-supervised learning. Can you unpack? For us, what do those mean? Particularly, what is self-supervised learning? Right. Um, so unsupervised learning is when you show uh, some objects, for example, and you just try to organize them. Uh, supervised learning is when you provide directions on the labels. For example, uh, if you would show some fruit and you say this is an orange and this is an apple and this is a banana, to your niece, then this is supervised learning. If you just tell her, like, can you organize them by categories? This is unsupervised learning. And then um, a problem with that we have in general in, on AI is that the current algorithms are not able to learn from little examples. So we as humans, we see a dog once, and we can tell it's a dog, or we can tell the breed of the dog. AI is not so great at this. Uh, what we've learned is the more examples we add, the better it gets. And and so far we have needed, if we want to train from scratch a system to learn about images, we have to provide it with millions of images. That's a bit too many to be uh, very practical, even though we have some ways to go around it because you can pre-train your algorithm uh, being quite generic learning um, to learn about motorbikes and uh and bananas, and then you can specialize if you want to know about uh, dogs. But it's still quite some uh, data that you need. So um, in the last years, I think there has been a bit of a some evolution on the what's called self-supervised learning, which is um, basically you give some exercises to the machine where you don't need so much extra data. Uh, for example, um, in NLP, so in a language analysis, what you can do is you can take Wikipedia and you can blank out some words and then tell the machine now, guess what these words were. And if it guesses well, then it will start to get a good understanding about uh, our language and our world. Uh, another thing that you can do is for images, for example, you can rotate them randomly and then uh, tell the system now, try to figure out what was the original orientation. And I don't know if you realize, but sometimes babies do the same. Like they tend to rotate things and they they wonder at these things. And uh, you have to see that to understand what's the original rotation, you have to see if there is a tree that then you will know uh, there is a tree. Trees grow vertically. And uh, and this is great because it allows you to reduce the amount of data that you need uh, to a fraction, for example, uh, around 1%. And with that, it means that maybe uh, we'll be able to democratize uh, the use of AI with less data. And now, okay. to your question, is AI about automation, prediction, or Talking about giving exercises, <laughs> so that's an exercise for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, I'd say uh, everything, but I think it's moving away from uh, automation. You get, to pick one of, you get to pick only one of where those. We were just, hmm? You get to pick only one of those. I can only pick yeah. one of those. <laughs> so maybe it's a prediction. prediction. Okay. I don't okay. know. What do you think? I, 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 I have my I have my own view, but uh, I'm I'm a moderator, so I can't assert right. too much. But uh, I, I, but anyway, I, it, but thank you so much. So 
Uh, guys, we got only about uh, three minutes, less than three minutes. Uh, audience, I'll go to you first. Uh, any question, please drop it in the chat real quick. Um, uh, otherwise, let's do a, a just a 10-second sweep. Any closing comments? Um, you know, uh, any call for action? Any uh, call for collaboration? Uh, let me start with Marta. Uh, 10 seconds, real quick. Okay, 10 seconds. Um, I guess I would just say in closing that um, uh, AI really... Um, uh, ultimately, the issue with AI, right, isn't that you it's going to do something you don't want it to do. The, the problem is it's going to do exactly what you tell it to do. So be careful what you tell it to do. Um, Rana? Rapid fire? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, my only closing comment is that despite, uh, you know, the lot of concerns out there, for the most part, uh, AI is doing a world of good and it's helping solve many, many complex problems. And it's not only improving the overall experience, but also really sort of bridging the gap. And we've seen it firsthand in terms of all this COVID crisis. It's played a tremendous role, not just in the vaccine fight, but also in just getting us back up as a workforce and getting us more productive. And so for, from that perspective, okay. there's a lot more to be optimistic about. All right, go on. Yeah, I agree with Rana, and AI has the potential to solve some of the most complex and challenging problems that humanity faces, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, food supply, and so on and so forth. And but we need to make sure that uh, those um, those policies, those these technologies, is being implemented um, in a way to benefit most the most the, you know as many people as possible. So that's the importance of. Thank you, Ella. For me, is the heart failure is a drug uh, that to find a drug through the AI and collaborate with the world. So I invite everyone actually to come forward to collaborate. So genetically defined diseases are many, and uh, finding the perfect drug is a collaboration. So anyone who has uh, you know up to date, we are open. And uh, I also say AI will open the door for drugs for children because there is no drugs for children. It's not possible. But clinical trials will be available if you can create their heart tissues and integrate uh, the, the AI you. people will need Thank to do you. that. Julian, Thank five you. seconds. Yeah, I think there is technology to uh, address most problems like bias or uh, black boxes. So do look at it. Thank you. Thank you. The acts of God which have no discretion, the accidents which have discretion, there are attacks which have discretion. Um, and AI is between discretion and inertness. We got to figure that. We got to figure that equilibrium out between AI being discretionary or being inert, somewhere in between. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure with everybody. Uh, thank you, audience, for joining. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think. Uh, I guess it's over. Um, Thank you, Guru. Yeah, uh, uh, was it? Uh, was I? I hope I wasn't too troublesome. No, I think that was a good. Everybody get you know good amount of chances, and I think we have still people. Yes, I think we're still live. Be careful. Let's be careful where we sit. <laughs> No, all, I think uh, usually, the, usually the room shuts down. Uh, well, it says yeah. live, but uh, I th yeah, maybe it's just extra time that uh, yeah, maybe the room is still open. That's fine. Uh, we can we can we can talk. We can talk, but uh, that's fine. Um, uh, you know, I was just saying. I hope I wasn't too troublesome. And uh, to me, it was. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and uh, so glad to get the privilege. We enjoyed your leadership. Thank you very much for. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the audience, you did an amazing yeah, the job. Yeah, didn't realize what an amazing job you did in preparing all the panelists. So, <laughs> thank you for doing it. The best prepared panel what? I've ever I've ever been on. Oh, you're too kind. I agree. You're too kind. You guys you <laughs> have so much firepower. You know, I I had to. I couldn't even hold a flame to it. So, but thank you. Thank you so much. I, I I'd like to keep up with all of you. Uh, there's so much that I can learn and, uh, you know, a few things that we could probably uh, probably collaborate. So uh, please stay in touch and uh, let me know anything I can help with. Likewise. Thank you very Thank much. You. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.